Gracias por invitarme a Horta en Sevilla. Esta es mi primera visita, pero es tan maravilloso que no puedo esperar a volver. And this is where the Spanish ends. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. So, uh, let me start with you. You heard about me a little bit. Um, let me have an idea. How many of you here are developers? Raise your hand. Not me. <laughs> okay. How many designers? Oh, cool. And how many marketers? Cool. Good. Um, well, hello, friends. Because you do know you are all friends today. They are all friends today. Um, I've been introduced already. This is what I do. It sounds like a lot, but I actually really do all that stuff. And this is the three representations of me that I use. And you will understand what I mean with that um, in a little while. So we're going to talk about three things today. The first thing is going to be what a brand is and what is not. Because there's a lot of misconception about that. Second, I'm going to briefly show you how the concept of branding has, was born and has evolved. And then I'm going to give you my recipe to create and build your brand. So let's start. Usually when people see this slide, they kind of go like this. Um, and what I mean with this slide is that how many of you use the term brand and logo as synonyms? Thank you, the courageous only hand. Because I know you all do, we all do, but it's wrong. A brand is not a logo, and a logo is not a brand. Let me show you. What is this? Nike, right. Um, this is Nike, right? This is Nike. This is the attitude, the style. Um, this is their mission. This is their stated mission on their website. So you see, this is Nike's logo, but this is Nike's brand. Okay? Let me give you another example. And if those of you who recognize this, don't say it out loud. Do you, who knows what this is? Okay. So this is a logo, by all means. But this is the brand. Okay? This is the logo of the New Zealand All Brand, All Blacks, not All Brands. Um, but this is the All Blacks, right? The haka, the way they play rugby, the, play, the way they make you feel. Not if you need them at night, but that's another thing. Uh, so, the point is that the logo is the representation of a set of intangible values that set a company or a product apart from the rest. So the brand is that set of intangible values. To borrow from Anne Hanley and see France, the brand is the emotional aftertaste that comes after an experience with a product or a service or a company or a person or an entity. Think of, think of my computer slowly rolling down on the floor. No, don't think about that. Think of a logo as a two-dimensional icon that represents a multi-dimensional experience, the brand. So if you look at any of these, I'm sure you recognize some of these companies or products, and you would get feelings. They could be good feelings or bad feelings, but you get feelings. So the logo is what represents those feelings, but it's not those feelings. So how did we get here? Branding has evolved uh, and we will see in what a huge way. So, the first practice of branding can be traced back to 50,000 years ago, and it was used for ownership. 
The purpose was to, to establish what belonged to whom. And we have proofs in the cave paintings, these are from the Lescaux caves that date about 50,000 years ago. Uh, there's pictures of uh, uh, marked cattle. You see it there? Um, and there's more. I just didn't put all the pictures in there. Um, all properties considered precious were marked, were branded with, with the owner's marks. By 2000 BC, owners switched to a more permanent method, and that is burning. Egyptian funeral documents uh, and monuments de depict uh, branded cattle, cattle being branded. And this is the tools that they're used. And in fact, the word branding comes from the Old Norse, uh, brander, which means to burn. The second purpose that branding uh, solves was to establish a product's origin, along with transferring information as to who or where a good was produced. Kind of like a label today would do. Uh, the practice was spread worldwide. Um, engravings were found with from China, India, Greece, Rome, uh, Mesopotamia. Uh, some of the earliest known marked pottery, this is from China, dates back more than 5,000 years. And archaeologists have identified over a thousand unique potter's marks that were used in the, during the first three centuries in the Roman Empire. Uh, this means that in the in three centuries in the Roman Empire, there were a thousand different brands, shops of potters, and they all signed their work. And we could assume, you know, people would be like, oh, you know, I got this from Titus, which is a lot cooler than mine, and you know, or maybe not. Maybe we only do this today. Moving. Middle Ages, guilds began to want to distinguish their product. So paper makers and printing houses used watermarks, and stonemasons and quarries developed an elaborate system of marks. There's a whole story about this, which is really, really fascinating, to identify their work. In the Renaissance, artists like Michelangelo started actually signing their names before they only used little symbols uh, to sign their work. And this is a detail of that part of the Pietà. This introduced um, a new type of branding, authorship, and the notion of brand as reputation. Fast forward to the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution, uh, implied mass production, but all goods were created equal, like people. Uh, so products needed to be distinguished, you know, from one factory to the other. So companies started branding first the containers their goods were shipped in, and then they started branding the singular package, and this is you know, the, the beginning of packaging design. And in some ways, you also wonder how come some of our packaging today is so ugly compared to, you know, 150 years ago, but that's, again, another talk, some other time. So, um, obviously, companies put in a lot of effort and money in this practice. So they started saying, hey, uh, lawmakers, we need to defend all the work that we put into branding our products. And in 1875, the Trademarks Registration Act provided that protection. It also meant that a brand now became an asset for the company. And a brand could be owned, could be sold, and had economic value. With so many brands, though, uh, entering the market and so many products that were alive, 
that companies needed to further differentiate and also try to outsell the other ones that were just like them. Uh, here comes advertising. So, um, advertising was a very little known practice until uh, a gentleman by the name of James Walter Thompson realized that there was something extremely valuable in this trade. Um, and he was very farsighted. Uh, his agency was the first one to establish a creative department to produce content for its clients. But he went further than that. He wrote two books, the um, Thompson Red and Blue Books of Advertising. So it wasn't really a great copywriter, but uh, they were guides to advertising opportunities in all markets. And these open up a whole world. As you can imagine, advertising requires media that is widely spread. So the first mediums of, of advertising were TV, I'm oh, sorry, were print and radio. And the first, so that's where the first budgets went. And then television was a huge game changer. Um, in 1941, Boulevard Fox released the first ever TV commercial. Uh, by 1952, so 10 years later, ad revenue surpassed magazine and radio combined. And this ushered in what is known as the golden age of advertising, which is also known as the mad man. In the 50s and the 60s, um, advertising evolved. You know, it, had, it was now about 30, 40 year old and had the time to uh, evolve. And it went from being a unique selling proposition, meaning, hey, I exist, buy me, you really need me, buy me, to an uh, emotional selling proposition. Because Companies realized that just putting a logo on a product and saying it exists wasn't sufficient anymore. So the communication had to be emotional in an effort to give the product's personality. In the 70s, television sets were common. They were everywhere, every household had at least one. Consumers became very brand conscious, and by the 80s, brands had become status symbols. And the formula was very clear. Good commercial, massive spending, and that's it. Your brand became really popular and really fast. In the 80s and 90s, companies began to understand that they had to cultivate their company brand, not so much so than their product's brand. And they started uh, focusing on corporate identity and advertising the company as a source, uh, and establishing as a good source for their products. But it is between the 1990s and the 2010s that things once again totally changed. Uh, the digital revolution made it so that by the end of the 1990s, Internet was widely available, at least in Western countries. And in a little over two decades, our entire way of communicating and interacting with each other and with the brands has completely changed. In terms of branding, this has had two major implications. The first one is that there's nowhere to hide. Information is out there. People are watching, people are recruiting. And so blunders are bigger. And companies need to be very careful. They need to stay alert and they need to avoid scandals because scandals equal loss of equity. Remember that value that um, the act gave to brands? So, um, do you remember about a year ago, um, a Japanese 
um, passenger being dragged off uh, an airplane, a United Airlines airplane. Okay, whenever something like that happens, the first thing that happens is the company stock plummets. So whenever companies screw up, they get hit financially right away. So they have to be careful. The second implication is that with internet, blogs, and social media, we are all brands now. And we can all access, you know, potential instantation, instantaneous limelight and become really famous. But we can also get trolled and, you know, abused online. So we need to learn to stay in this environment. Nonetheless, we can all become very popular, potentially, and we can become influencers, which is what kids want to do now. I mean, you know, when, when I was young, kids wanted to either be soccer players or models. Girls wanted to be models. <laughs> um, now kids are like, that's work. I just want to hang out and do videos and have people, you know, watch my videos and get rich from it. So, here's some kids who did very well. Uh, you all know Kara Pagani? You've heard of her? Yes? No? Show hands? Okay, one, yeah. <laughs> I do really know too. Okay. Um, well, Kiara Pagani in 2016 had a net worth of $12 million. She started with, um, she started fashion blogging in Italy, which when she started meant that she would get dressed up and take pictures of herself and publish them and someone cared. Like, not me, but other people cared. And they would say, ooh. Um, anyway, uh, she's doing a lot better than I'm doing. Uh, now, she I can relate to, okay? Grumpy Cat is someone I adore. I use Grumpy Cat with my students. Uh, I, I show them that, you know, my students, the first day we have lesson, I, you know, show a picture of Grumpy Cat and I tell them, if you get an email from me with a big picture of Grumpy Cat, you're in trouble. <laughs> so make sure you don't see that. And the third example is like Bluey. Um, Lady Singh, who I had no clue who she was, has, these are data from December 2017, so it's rather recent. Uh, she has a total reach of 247 million people. Okay? She has 73 million followers on um, YouTube. She does these videos, and I guess. You know, 247 million people find them funny. I don't, but who am I? But she's 28, I guess now 29. Again, there's something wrong in how I see things, but anyway, let's get back to the point. So, branding from ownership to origin and quality to identification to differentiation to company asset to status symbol. To reputation. Today, your brand is your kept promise to your customer. Or to put it with Jeff Bezos, your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. But what about us? I mean, we don't have to get like, you know, built million. Should we build or manage our personal or business brand? The answer is yes, you should. How? Let me show you. I'm going to run. Rule number one, know yourself and your products or service. It's hard to tell other people what you do if it's not really clear to you. Know your customer. Um, who is, not everyone is going to want you or your product. Uh, not because they don't like you, just they don't need you. So you need to know who needs you, whose life you can make better, and talk to them. Know your market. Know which pond you're swimming in. What else is there? Know your competition. 
have a clear vision. You need to you need to know. It's like when you're taking a road trip. Even if it's only you know a general direction, you need to know where you're going in order to get there. You have to have values, and you need to stand by them. Remember United Airlines. Keep your promises. People will know if you don't. Have a plan. Again, road trip. You can't just like get up one morning and go, oh, I'm going to do this. You know, it, it, it's, it's strategic. You have to get your strategy together and then apply it, not the other way around. Now, only now, at this point, where you need to give your brand an appropriate personality is when you get to work on your logo. Your logo does not appear up until now. And the way you can convey your brand's personality is through graphic design, and the key is consistency. The tone of voice, and the key is coherence. Communication, how, where, and in which way you communicate with your audience. And the key here is confidence, because it's not that intuitive. Fourth is how you treat your customers, how you talk to them, how you answer them, how you support them. The key is service. Back to the main list, don't skip. I mean, you don't have to have a huge budget, but you can't expect this to be done for free by itself. Work hard, stay consistent, chat often. Like all valuable things, it's going to take effort. Lastly, this is not mandatory, but I highly recommend it. Uh, be aware of yourself, of your surroundings, of the people that you interact with. Be present. Be mindful. And if your brand is a personal brand, steps one through seven apply just the same. Rules nine through eleven apply just the same. Rule number eight, you are your brand. It should have your personality. Opportunity her, but it has to be true to yourself. A brand is an organic, living, breathing being. It's alive. It needs care and nurturing to grow and to prosper. You need to give it your best. You need to love it and foster it and care for it. And if you step on a food, and we all do, and not once, own it, apologize, fix it as best as you can, and mostly learn from it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. At any time, if you have questions, you can hunt me down. Um, and here are the slides if you want to take a picture. Okay. Well, you can ask questions in Spanish, and we'll get them translated and I'll mine the, the answer. There's a question there. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm trying to learn you speak in English. Thank you. Um, the question is, um, when you are, um, you have a, a brand of a company, yes. you have to design the website, okay? Yes. Uh, which is your uh, best deal with, with, with that? Which, which is the... Um, the most important, uh, the most difficult thing to, to manage with um, when you are designing uh, or you are um, translating the brand to the website? Um, well, that's, you can place the website um, in point eight after you have identified 
your logo and your tone of voice and, and what your message is. Because if you don't have all those informations, uh, it's hard to put, the, you know, you get to the website and you're like, uh, okay, uh, what do I put here? Um, so that's why I can't stress enough how important it is to have a, a plan. Because if you, once you, you, are, you have clearly identified, okay, I'm Raffaella and I'm a designer. And uh, so as a designer, who is my target client that we design? Um, what would they be looking for? You know, first, certainly they're going to want to see my portfolio. Then they're certainly want to know, you know, who I am, what's my story. Um, and thirdly, though they're not going to look for it, they are going to feel coherent. So if I'm a designer and I have like a, a really sloppy looking, ugly portfolio, you know, if I'm a copywriter and I have typos, you know, and horrible, you know, language, uh, you know, the viewer goes, uh, I don't think so. Um, so it's really important that we see our logo and our website has our, our, us translated into a digital experience and that what we sell, we have to do first for ourselves. You know, because otherwise people are going to be like, uh, yeah, if you do mine like you did yours, uh, next. Is that, does that help? Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, thank you for your speech you. I like it. And also I want to tell you if those tips for a new brand are also to take uh, in, in the beginning of the, the brand, how to set up of that way? Um, well, whether you do a, a brand, a new branding or a rebranding, um, the, the process is really the same. Okay, it's really important that you start with with that strategy, points one through seven. You know, what is this brand about? You know, what I'm gonna use me, you know, I, but I mean me the brand, me the the, the, the thing that I'm that I need to create a brand for. So what do I do? What do I do? And who do I do it for are the key information. If it's not clear what you do, and if it's not clear who you're selling it to, who you want to talk to, it's going to be very difficult for the communication to be effective. Because if you're trying to, um, that's one thing that's usually very hard with clients, because it's like, you know, who's your target? Well, everybody. Well, no. You know, everybody is no one's target. Never. I mean, not even Coca-Cola is as everybody as a target because there's people that don't drink sodas you know and and so so my target the the most accurate work is on targeting that needs to be done because the more i pinpoint who i'm talking to the more i can be accurate with the style with the tone of voice with how I communicate, you know, if I'm selling skateboards, I'm going to have a certain look, a certain attitude, a certain style. If I'm selling earring aids, I'm going to have a different tone of voice, a different way to, you know, a different look. Uh, because if my audience is, you know, teenagers or, you know, if they're 17, I speak to them in a way, if they're 17, I speak to them in a different way. And if that's not clear, then your communication gets all marked. Because people think, well, I would like that. But who keeps a uh, cuckoo? You know, it's not you. 
that's the other thing that we all have to be careful of. You know, that's a design result also. You know, we are not necessarily our targets. So we, we need to put a little buffer, a little distance between what we would like and what our audience needs to like. Does that help you? We go? Lunch? <laughs> no? Oh? Oh? Do you try and see? Okay, uh, I have oh. oh, okay. okay. So we need to go, but I'm sorry, we, I need to leave room, but I'll be outside and I can answer all the questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.